We're living in a digital world, but only 0.3% of professionals know how to program, how to code. How can we keep going with only 0.3% doing the development work to create everything that the other 99.7% of professionals who need to use in their work? Recently, a group of companies has started to challenge this status quo. These companies are building what have become known as no-code solutions or no-code tools. Tools that allow non-technical people to create digital products. In this series of videos, we're going to talk to some of the people behind these companies. These are some of the movers and the shakers that are helping to push forward the no-code movement. We're here today with uh, David Atkin, who's a founder of Adalo. David, I'd like to thank you again for taking the time to join us for this conversation. Yeah, I'm uh, uh, really, really excited to be here, honestly. It's, uh, it's always really great talking to everyone in the no-code community. Uh, there's so many different perspectives, so many different people trying to solve so many different things. So uh, I just, I really love talking with you all. And it just, it definitely motivates me to, uh, and motivates everyone on a dollar to, to keep going. So uh, excited to talk to you all. Thank you. So um, let's start with, with the basics, I guess. Um, for, for those of, that are watching and not familiar with Adalo yet, uh, could you tell us uh, what <laughs> makes Adalo different from other tools? And yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. So, um, so no, uh, Adalo in the no code space is in the app builder section. I believe you know the no code space has everything from your automation, which is maybe a little more invisible, where you're connecting to some sort of app doing something in some other system. There's even games, there's voice, uh, and there's more like your your docs data storage with Airtable. And then there's websites like with Card and Webflow. So Adalo is definitely more on the full app uh, building side of that kind of spectrum. And then within that spectrum, uh, I would say Adalo falls uh, we started out mobile first and mobile only, actually. Um, so primarily, we started out uh, native uh, first. So you could publish to Android and iOS app stores. We also now have web apps as well. Um, so you can definitely publish across all of those different platforms where some of the app builders are maybe just on the web um, or just uh, mobile for um, for. Uh, PWAs and those sorts of things. Adalo can do uh, native uh, and PWA and web. Um, we definitely started uh, mobile first and are kind of working our way to being more and more responsive. That's, I'm sure we'll get into that later. Uh, but so it's a, it's a really great, easy um, way to, to build apps, whether that is for, uh, you know, if you have a startup side hustle that you want to do or whether you are a business owner or whether you're a freelancer and you used to make websites for people or you still make websites for people and now you also want to make apps for people, you can do that uh, as well. Interesting. And one thing, David, what motivated you to create a no-code tool? Tell us yeah. about your background. Why did you <laughs> yeah, come yeah. into the no-code thing? And why create a no-code yeah, tool? Yeah, so um, let's see. So my background is originally actually in architecture. I got my master's of architecture. Um, and I was all set, ready to be an architect. And then I got really passionate about, uh, the power of design and architecture school. I really feel like that's the most important skill for the 21st century is that you have, and my concept of design is definitely more, uh, it's definitely broad. It's not necessarily just, some people think about it as just either pixels or the visuals and things like that. I have a much more broad uh, view. Some people call it design thinking, creativity, problem solving, whatever you want. I, I bucket those all together. So I really got excited about teaching people that how to bring their ideas to life. Um, so then I got into a startup um, for a little bit, not didn't start the startup. I, there was just a startup in, in St. Louis. I convinced them that I could do UX design, even though I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so I took my, uh, I took my design <laughs> skills in architecture. Uh, you know, I always was like, oh, well, you can flow through a building like you flow through an app um, and the pitch worked. So then I was working for them uh, for quite some time. Uh, and I kind of watched the transformation of UX design tools go from when I first started, um, 
they were pretty crude in terms of like the font. Now we would call that wireframing. Um, I guess it was probably called wireframe at the time, but that was like the only thing you could do was wireframe. So yeah, so you would make uh, mockups that looked like pretty just like sketches, right? And um, they were pretty ugly and they got better and better and better. And I would present those to our company for feedback and I got better and better at making them. And I remember there was sometimes when I, you know, it, it started to evolve, right? And I mean, then we got Sketch and then Figma and UX Pin, all these kind of things. And I was presenting and, uh, you know, people after the presentation would go, oh, so like now it's re ready or like now now it's live. And I would be like, no, no, no. Like I'm just the, the like that was all fake. Um, and that struck me a couple times because it was like, well, yeah, I mean, it looks so like, it looks almost like it, you know what? Why can't I just take it that next step, you know, what is it really missing um, that that would turn it into to reality? Uh, so there was a little bit of that happening. There was my passion for design and helping people solve problems that was getting meshed into this pot of how I got into Adalo no code. And then another aspect I think was, you know, there was this debate at the time, which I think has kind of subsided a little bit, whereas like you're not a true UX designer if you don't know how to code was like part of the big, big like debate at the time. And, uh, you know, so I like, tried to do some coding classes and it was difficult. You know, I, my brain works really visually. I don't know how to code. Um, and I just remember even thinking to myself one day, like, because I think like the UX design tools are getting better and better. And I was just like, Someone's going to like, by the time I learn code, someone's going to have come up with a way for me to do code without code. I didn't actually think like that would like, I would be helping in that journey. But I do remember that, like I had some thoughts of those things. Um, so I would say it was a melting pot between all of those things. Um, and then it was just like, Hey, how can we take, uh, so then at the time me and, uh, one of the other, um, now he's a co-founder, but one of the other employees at the company, we started figuring out like, okay, how could we take, um, you know, prototyping tools and just make it real? Like that was kind of the impetus behind it. Um, I know this is like another kind of question we want to get to later, which is like, when did you get into no code? And I think actually I didn't realize, uh, it's pretty crazy, but like, so what, what we were, the, the previous company that I worked for, it's just a, a great company. It's called Second Street. They, they really target like local media companies. So they're not like a um, like big, like, you know, fun, like crazy tech company necessarily. Um, I think because they're mainly targeted towards local media, they do amazing stuff. But um, they, uh, at the time, you could make... Um, basic like sweepstakes uh, without coding, which is kind of like a website. You could make a basic photo contest without coding. You could send emails. So we were making like email builders without kind of code. So looking back, there was a lot of like, I mean, like essentially a, a sweepstakes is kind of like a website without code. And you, you, there was different templates you could pick from. And then, you know, in the email builder, there was different, uh, templates you could pick from. And then we got to the point where you could move things around inside of it. Um, so there is definitely a lot of like, you know, similarities there between, uh, you know, those kind of templated SaaS products that, that then also I think led their way into, um, into some of the, you know, design strategies that we use at Adalo were kind of just built off of like, I guess you could say this is maybe the third or fourth. It's like the next step, right? If it was websites to email to like app building, you know, I kind of designed a few different designers, which starts to get very meta and it's, uh, you know, um, inside of it. But uh, so, yeah, I think uh, a lot of those things all kind of coalesced for, for me, um, and Adalo, um, um, that, that made it like extremely like the perfect thing that, that I, I'm extremely passionate and just really want to keep doing, honestly, this type of thing of, of helping people create ideas out of nothing is definitely what I feel like is, is like my like life's mission. I don't think I could take different forms. It could, it could be an app, which it is right now. And it might be other things in the future in terms of like, maybe it isn't software or whatever, but that, that concept of, learning to create from an idea in your head to like an executed thing is really what I get, get excited about. So 
in this in this like journey that you you come through and to where you're now when you look ahead how do you see this crop of no code tools and some local tools uh, penetrating the market the markets and how do you think it will look like in about two or three years <clears throat> yeah it's definitely an interesting question so you know if you look back at the trends it has it was you know low code kind of started back with like visual basic in the end of the 80s or you know 90s ish and then um in the 2000s you know you definitely have the, the low code side of things really starting to penetrate into the enterprise marketplace they're primarily right now still targeted towards uh larger enterprise dev teams that um it's basically like hey instead of having 20 developers now you could have you know four developers and you could use our low code platform so still really targeted towards what i would say developers but just making them go faster um and so i think let's see there are a couple of ways that i think no code will kind of penetrate there's i guess there's like the three different like, I guess I would say groups of people. There's the enterprise one, which I think I started to go down, which will, so we can finish that one or we can start with that one right now. Um, you know, I think that what happens with low code right now is that the people that are using low code are not the end users of whatever that solution is for. So really like they're building an internal app for their sales team or for a marketing team or something like that, or maybe a product team. Um, and I think that no code tools will start to make their way into enterprise where then you view it as like just another like, like chest in like your just like PowerPoint and slides and Excel and like those types of things. It's like, well, I had, now I had just whip up a little no code solution for uh, some project that I'm working on or to make that process that I have go faster and faster. Um, so you know, anytime you're doing anything in spreadsheets or sending something to an email back and forth, I think that is, will really get penetrated by, by low code or sorry, by no code. Um, cause I think it's still kind of siloed in with low code. Um, and I think then that, that also means it's going to come down the spectrum from being just available for very large enterprises, which I think low code is really primarily still just for, um, in terms of how expensive, uh, and allowing it to be, you don't need to be a fortune, you know, 100, 500 company. You could just have a hundred employees and maybe that's not an enterprise, but a larger established company and start to use these type of internal apps, I think, uh, will be interesting. I think there's another spectrum of the, and it's similar, but the small business or just the, uh, you know, the, the business owner that, uh, you know, let's say right now has primarily used freelancers and your local tech person or like that local tech person to like help me make my website. Now I think that's going to start moving a ton into all of the no code space. And if it are, hasn't already, honestly, it really is with, you know, with websites for sure is dominated by that. Now uh, I don't think, I think some of those higher end businesses still go to um, higher end dev shops. And I think that'll always be the case for, you know, the elite brands and stuff like that. But um, I think that there's a massive opportunity for anybody who um, there's so many little smaller businesses. And I don't even mean like super small business. I mean, it, again, it could be anyone from 10 employees to a hundred employees that uh, you know, you'll be starting to create apps uh, for, for these types of companies that are not just internal apps, maybe at those larger enterprises, but are actually externally facing and communicating with their customers, uh, and solving needs like that. Um, you know, whether it's a high end fitness gym that now needs, that wants to send their clients workouts in a much better form instead of them spreadsheets and emails and stuff like that. Um, and then obviously, I mean, I think the, probably one of the biggest things, at least in the no code space right now is like the startups and side hustles and all that kind of stuff. There's such an obvious missing, like they have no choice right now in, in terms of it's either like find 30 grand and, and go get a developer or you know how to develop and then you could make it. Um, so I think a lot of startups, uh, you know, are starting on, on no code right now. So it's, it's the startups, the small businesses, the enterprises, um, 
that I think are kind of the immediate penetration. Uh, I think what's going to be fascinating, this is like a, like a, I think this is a, not happening right now. And I think it will be a, a little bit later. Um, but like after those ones have really kind of all, but it'll be really interesting to see, you know, I, I've been trying to figure out how this is going to work its way into, into actual tech products. Cause I think a lot of what I just talked about there, like their main product is not like a SaaS product. You know, those, those companies are still going to have tons of designers and developers that are going to be able to build more powerful things than no code can do at least at the moment. Um, I think actually how I do think no code will penetrate in, I think maybe the definition of it will evolve a little bit to be more of like a, like if you're familiar with framer and those types of things where um, it's more set up for um, designers to like using, like they're dra dragging and dropping blocks of code type of a thing. Um, and the developers have complete, complete control over the code. Um, but what's like, sorry, what I'm getting with this is like, I think it's gonna be fascinating on that end of the spectrum where, you know, one of the powers of no code is like, you can easily change things and you could like copy it and then spin it up. So like, what I think is going to happen is that you're going to have multiple versions of SaaS software in the future that are just, that are highly designed for specific niches. You know, like right now at every big SaaS company, there's all this feature bloat that happens because you it's one product and you just keep adding more and more and more features to it. And normally it's like the largest customer enterprises like are driving, like you're going to do this feature, you're going to do this feature. Um, and then you slam all these features into your product and it gets harder and harder to use. Um, but like, I think what's gonna happen with no code is that when it gets to the point that it's like really able to work with developers um, and like you're able to make like a complete replica of like your app and then like a designer is able to like change it for a specific persona or a specific like vertical really easily. And it's like, this is the perfect Trello for like, gym owners and this is the perfect trello for like restaurant owners and this is the perfect trello for you know xyz type of companies um and then like you eliminate features from them and, and add features and tweak features and you have designers that are like going down all of these paths that i think um i think that'll kind of that's like my far out like prediction for no code um in like uh i don't know like a 10 year time frame yeah it's it's interesting to to listen your vision because it's my ways i i came from a, a technical side me and my and mauricio we have a technical background we created products i work uh, for big companies like cio as a cio taking care of it departments and all of these things and what what calls my attention is that one of the most difficult things for corporations is to keep innovation moving on. Yeah. So there's yeah. now a, a hype about uh, being more agile. So agile frameworks and design thinkings and all of this. So people yeah. is getting very fast into the ideation phase, but they got stuck when they have to materialize the digital. Topic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> no, <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be amazing to see, you know, I, I do really believe that, especially the consultants, like no code will like actually like, you know, right now at the end of a design thinking sprint, you like deliver, here's like what we would imagine you should do. And here's some like some, some quotes for some made up people that we interviewed or something. And it's like, all right. And then you like kind of leave and like they the consultants are like, ha perfect. And then like, they basically like, if you don't do it, they're like idiots, you should have listened to us. And then, you know, like, and then they like, you know, walk, that's like a horrible way to say, it. I they have a lot of consultant friends. They do, they do more than that. So I shouldn't put them down too much, but like, you know, there's, that's like, that's like the pessimistic version of it right now, which you're talking about. And like, yeah, I mean, no code, you won't like, you'll actually be able to like, no, it's like, okay, like let's make that thing. And like, let's see what the actual KPIs are and like what the real user feedback is. Not like, well, if you could pretend that this was happening, like, like what would that imagine that would be like? And then, you know, it'll be much easier for those, especially like we're kind of in the lar the enterprise spectrum right now, those, those larger businesses to then actually invest maybe even more resources into um, 
you know, developing uh, homegrown solutions to those things if they have an inside dev team or just continuing to actually like, you know, utilize that and build off of it more and more. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there'll be a new breed of consultants for sure. That really is, you know, like, I think like no code will like, it's going to be like a job type almost. Um, not necessarily just like right now. I mean, there are no coders right now, obviously, which is all of us, but like, I think that like, yeah, might actually be like another role and, then like another like skill set that you have that that you're either a consultant doing that or you're in a you're in a larger enterprise doing that or you know maybe even those businesses that only have 50 employees hire a no coder to come in and automate all of their systems and keep their processes running smooth and create these smaller um solutions to communicate with their customers like i think that'll be like you know Again, I guess I think clearly like we're all biased here, but like, you know, there, there's a vision for it being like marketing, you know, uh, sales, like no code, like that that's actually like a, a you know, kind of a skill set that that you would need um, to have for your company to innovate like you're talking about. I, I can see that happening. I can see that. <laughs> yeah. Happening. Do you... Um, is there any specific example that you already have? Uh, I know that Adalo is a young company, but yeah. um, is there any specific example that you, you might give us of a case in which Adalo kind of made the difference to make a, a company or a product viable? Because it's, as you mentioned, you know, we are coming <laughs> from this situation where you, you actually still needed a lot of money to be able to put out a piece of software. Yeah. It's way cheaper than it used to be, but yeah. it's still quite expensive. So yeah. Any any case that comes to mind? Yeah, so I think there there's a small business case and then there's more of like um like you're saying like an innovative side of a larger enterprise case that those those two spectrums come to mind for me. Um so in terms of the, you know, smaller business one there was, you know, there is, there is, um, a, and again, COVID is certainly top of mind. So there are other ones, but you know, there, there is the, uh, there was a, a guy in, uh, Denver, Colorado, and, you know, he has a karate gym and then COVID hit and, um, he actually had tried hiring some developers, uh, you know, to, to make an app for him so that he could keep his business going so he could send the, you know, the karate lessons to the kids and they could send them their videos back and he could, you know, tell them what they were doing wrong in their, in their living rooms and stuff. Um, and why like, I love this one is cause like he found it all and like he made it himself, which is really cool. I think there are definitely a ton of the business owners that then hire some sort of, like I was talking about before, like a tech person to, to do it. And I think there's a huge opportunity there, but I also just love that he was like, I, I, I got to do this for my business. Um, and the kids were like really pushing for it because they were really excited when they hired a developer and then that didn't really pan out. Like the developer like couldn't get what he wanted in a cheap enough price and he had to like abandon it. And then he just found a and was able to make it totally themselves. Um, and you know, now that's allowed all of his business with all those kids to, to, to stay afloat. So there's definitely like tons of those, I would say smaller use cases. Uh, why I also love the, this larger one as well is it was, it was pre COVID, but then also COVID affected. So, I mean, everything feels a little COVID affected right now. Um, so, but, but this one was, and your point, so they're, um, so this one university, they're starting up a new program where, um, the best way I, I feel like I ruined the pitch for this program a lot, but, um, the, is like, you had to be like a Renaissance person in order to get an extra degree on your diploma at this university. It's a brand new, it was going to be a brand new degree or like, like kind of like an honors distinction, but you would get a, uh, well-rounded distinction if you throughout your four years, went to all of these different events across campus, across a variety of different disciplines. So you'd have to go to a business school lecture. You'd have to go to some art gallery exhibit. You'd have to go to, you know, some school social work, you know, a fundraiser or, or like a nonprofit event or something, right? All these different events. Um, and you had to gain all these points. And then at the end of your four years, you would 
uh, graduate with this extra distinction. And everyone would know like, oh, you're like a very well-rounded person on top of like whatever major you had, mm-hmm. which is a cool thing. So then, uh, so it was just getting started. It's getting pitched. Uh, and, you know, they were like, you're saying, this is kind of like a startup within uh, like a larger enterprise in that like they couldn't justify, you know, having developers make an app for this, but they also didn't know how they were going to track all these points across campus. Right. It's like they're everyone's going to be asking all the time. What are the events? What are the points for that? Where are my points? How are we going to validate these points? And like, that's a logistical nightmare for a new program that they're kind of piloting right before you can, in like, like we were talking about before, before you can really invest it, you know, let's say 10 years from now, it's super successful. Then like, well, it's easy to say, okay, like, you know, let's hire some developers to, you know, to build a full blown app for this. Right. But at the infancy, you know, um, they didn't really know what to do. Um, and, uh, so then they, uh, made an app on Adalo where, you know, it has all of the events people could, then send pictures like to prove that they went to this event. And then that person would get a notification. They would look at the picture, they would approve it or reject it. It would automatically add all those points up and people could see what events other students were going to. So like, oh, this is a popular event. Like I want to go to that event. All my friends are going to it. So it definitely had that blend of like social side of it, plus internal business logic side of things that, you know, is really where, you know, at the end of the day, apps are just spreadsheets. Um, but you know, like Instagram is a spreadsheet, right? It just happens to look better. Facebook is just a spreadsheet. They just display things in different ways. Um, so, you know, it's a great example of like, they could have done all this stuff in emails and spreadsheets, which has so many less advantages to it. So then they did this uh, thing and the first year went really well. And then COVID happened and everybody then a ton of the students were staying home. How are they going to get the points? So they actually needed to like quickly pivot the app and instead allow students to submit events that, that were like in their local areas or online conferences and like had to totally move around the, um, I mean, the, the main logic of the app was similar, but you know, it, those are brand new features that they had to add in that I don't think would have been possible to quickly change that given uh, like if they went more of like a traditional development route where, you know, they wouldn't be able to like change the app to fit the the new circumstances. Um, So it was, it was, it has just been a great kind of case study of, of, you know, exactly that type of app right now that is perfect for no code. Um, That, that, that it's like the app that you can't justify $30,000 for making something like that right now, right? Like later on down the line, as that program is more and more, you know, if, if it turns into an amazing thing for that university, then clearly they can. But, um, you know, I, I think uh, that's definitely one of the coolest things is, is there's a lot of ways that no code is, is unlocking what software is really meant or like what it, what it's going to be best at doing, you know, and kind of changing this perception of all apps are just social media and, you know, we're getting sucked into the, the phones to do this and that, um, which I think are really valid concerns. Uh, and, but it, you know, it's interesting that the, you know, when you don't have, when you don't have to have everything be driven by, um, you know, I would say like your bottom line profits uh, a- a- in terms of covering all the dev costs and investors and that have to keep, you know, validating these types of things, you know, you can just solve those smaller problems. Um, and there are a lot of those smaller problems that uh, I think software is, is really perfect for solving. Uh, tell us a little bit about the name. The name Adalo came from where? Where yeah. you came up with this idea? <laughs> so that one, um, that one was um, actually a, a lot. Uh, it was a collaboration between us, but it was it was a lot of uh, me on this one um, in terms of the founders. But um, it, it was uh, actually okay. So um, we originally. Well, we've had we've had a few different names. We were originally Proton, um, which uh, means to react in in Latin. So it was all about React Native, the code base, as well as you can react and change. You know, the molecule and a building block molecule, all those kind of things. Um, but um, that one felt 
a little too scientific and like was a little scary in terms of like, you know, we wanted to feel not like this is sciencey, but like, you know, everyone should know code. Um, and then next we were foundry. <laughs> um, and that was, uh, based on actually, um, an actual foundry where you kind of had, uh, you would make, different um casts and then put that like build like we had thought about like more like building blocks where you have like the code and that was like the cask and then you like put it into it and then you could combine those different building blocks into things so it was definitely more of still on the building metaphor and kind of on the casting metaphor and components and you know doll is very component driven um and then we ran into the problem that like there are a million foundries, like actual foundries in the world. So people finding us was impossible. Um, and then like we wanted to buy one of the, the big domains and um, and then the guy wanted like $100,000 for it. So we were like, well, how do we can't buy that. <laughs> so um, yeah, literally he wanted $100,000 for foundry. And which I guess probably people will buy, but we were like, okay, well then this is not good. So, so we couldn't do that. So we were like, okay, we got to change again. So, um, and we're like, we really got to make sure we get it right this time. So a lot of, a lot of, a lot of spreadsheets, but, um, actually it happened. Um, I really got inspired from, it really started in terms of how the inspiration came from Warby Parker. Um, so Warby Parker is a play on of two different characters. Warby Parker, the, the eyeglass store, the, it's a, it's a, one of their founders or all their founders, I don't know, maybe one of them really loves, um, this author and two of the characters are like Warby, um, I forgot Warby's last, there is, is a mash in between like, oh shoot, I'm screwing up the story. The like, uh, it was like uh, Pepper, like it, Parker was the person, was one of the characters' first name, and then Warby was one of the characters' first name. It was like a mashup of like two of their names or something like that. Um, and from from a, from a book that he was like really inspired by. So it was like, I was really inspired by this book, and I mashed up a couple of the characters' names to be Warby and Parker, even though they were two different characters in the book. So I was like, oh, that's an interesting kind of concept and like a way to come up with a name is like, Oh, you should find a story that you're inspired by and maybe mash up the the things to get a brand new name, right? Because again, we were foundry was like too common of a word and we were afraid to do normal sounding words. Um, and so then we started putting together a huge list of like what are all of the different like, you know, people in tech that are inspire us or designers or entrepreneurs that inspire us. And then eventually we, we landed on Ada Loveless. Um, and, you know, she's widely considered to be the world's first, you know, programmer, which was really awesome. She had a vision for everyone, you know, being able to create programs that would help in everyday life. Um, a lot of that stuff was like very, very theory based at the time of like, oh, like, you know, we're going to take these punch cards and be able to create programs out of them that will solve everyday problems. Um so, you know, Adalo is Ada and the beginning of, of her last name, Loveless. And it was a way to kind of mash those two up and create our own word, but still kind of have this like homage to, um, to her kicking off the, you know, software revolution. Great. That's a very interesting uh, yeah. story, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really. But uh, when when you were creating the the tool, uh, were you actually inspired by anything that came before uh, in terms of how it works? Yeah, so I was definitely really I talked touched on this a little bit before, but for sure inspired by a lot of the UX design tools and the trends that were happening there. <clears throat> um, so, and I think there were a couple of big trends that are happening or are we're still whatever we're still kind of, you know, Adal is really not that old either. So we're all, all still happening. Um, you know, one of them was, um, one of them is, is the concept of, of design systems, you know, uh, you know, five years ago, it was 10 years ago for sure. 15 years ago, it was a wild, wild west in UX design. 
every single time you'd want to make an, uh, either a software or something, you'd come up with a brand new design and there was no conventions for, um, you know, now we have silly names for them and people make fun of them, like the hamburger menu and stuff like that. But I mean, th that concept of like, Hey, here's this thing that you're used to. And it does this thing is very analogous to the way humans work in the real world where like, I have a switch and I know this switch like does, you know, you know, there's these kind of common set of behaviors that, uh, you know, humans have evolved to, to know. Um, and now that's started to really happen in software where there are these components, these building blocks that it's like, okay, I know every app has, or a lot, most apps have a nav bar at the bottom with tabs that like I can go to. So um, we knew we wanted to be building block design system component first, whatever term you're kind of like there of all those things. Um, that was definitely an important thing. Uh, and then, you know, I really liked all the direction that a lot of the prototyping tools were going, especially being able to have a blank canvas that you could work on and move around on. You know, I'm very much a designer that, you know, I think it helps like seeing different things, like being over here at the same time can help you like put together different connections. Uh, and sometimes it, it, can, it can be a bad thing because you're like jumping all over the place. But I think that a lot of times like, you know, allows you to see the whole lot more and not just be focused on one of the, the trees in the forest, but you're, you're, you can zoom into it, but you can also zoom out and see everything. Uh, and I think that allows you to have a little more playful maybe I'm a little bit of like a weird designery type of person that likes this whole idea of playing and, and stuff like that. You can move things around a little easier, definitely inspired by, by that type of behavior. And then, you know, I think one of the biggest things that I hated about prototyping tools that I wanted to change with and, and that uh, we'll have to see, hopefully as it all gets more complicated, whether the theory pans out, but you know, in most prototyping tools, there's actually two different sides and, and it still is the case on a lot of different of, of the platforms, not just prototyping, but like Webflow and other types there's, there's that. Uh, and I think that really eats up the real estate for one. And I think actually you never use, well, I shouldn't say never, but you hardly, hardly ever use both sides at the same time. Like if you go into, you know, Adobe, there's a bunch of tools on the on the right and there's a left panel of tons of things. And then there's a right panel of tons of things. And if you go into all the prototyping tools, there's a left panel of layers of things and there's a right panel of tons of things. And like, I always felt like you weren't using both of them at the same time. So like, how could you actually like put them into one panel together? Um, so that was definitely one of the, like at the beginning, um, strategies that I was trying to have to, to, to like get inspired by that. There's those two concepts, but how could they actually be combined together? Uh, like in, into, into one system. Um, so like I said, we'll have to see whether, <laughs> whether that, whether like it'll, it'll remain that way. But, um, you know, I definitely was, you know, really inspired by all of the design products that are out there, not just for prototyping, but Illustrator and Photoshop and, and, and other things that maybe are less designery, but still like common, you know, we've always tried to say we want to make apps as easy as making a slideshow. So the fact that, you know, you have your different screens or your different slides and you're clicking on the different elements of them and you can move things around and, and kind of create a slideshow. We think everyone, can make a slideshow. There are people that can make slideshows look a lot prettier than others, but um, just like there are people that can make adult apps look prettier than others, but that whole concept of, of easy to move around and things like that. So I don't know. That was a whole mishmash answers of things I was inspired <laughs> by. <Yeah. laughs> Interesting. One thing, that, considering all the concepts that you guys are putting into Adalo, when you compare the Adalo product that you have right now with the other ones that are in the no code arena right now, which ones do you think are moving into the right direction compared to what Adalo is doing? Um, you mean like which ones are doing it better than us or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, in, 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 yeah, in, in, just in terms of if you are going to start right now, of course you are going to start with Adalo because you are working with Adalo. Oh, right. but you, yeah, but if you compare with the other players because this market is it's huge right now we have in, in our in our community more a catalog of more than 170 tools right now yeah. in different things so of course not everybody's doing the right thing at the right moment there are some things that are older and uh, there are other tools that are very complicated so considering the 
the ones that are more in the in the hype right now how do you feel that which ones are moving in the, in a better way than the other ones yeah let's see um i definitely think in terms of like the priorities for like what no code platforms like the the better no code platforms i think ones that are and this is in no order so i'm just starting to list some stuff yeah, yeah. Not, a, not a priority order to my response but i definitely think um you know integrations is a really important thing being able to make sure that your no code platform can work with other no code platforms i think is is really powerful right now because it is such a complicated thing that is possible or like there's so many like you know like we just recently made it possible and now you can connect to parabola and do amazing things in parabola right and that's just you know one example right but it's like we don't have the time to like worry about automations and scheduling rules and all these different kinds of things that you might want to do right um so being able to make sure that you're, you're playing friendly with, I think, a bunch of the other uh, no-code space, I think is, is an important thing. I think um, making sure that you're really setting a good foundation for the, like, the community and, and all of the, and that's, a, that's probably one of our biggest things that we're trying to focus on right now. Uh, maybe we haven't done the best job of being self-critical. We're trying to do an even better job there of, of making sure that you know, we have a really strong foundation for making sure we're communicating with the community, making sure that, um, you know, we're able to give the, the support, the educational content that needs to come with, you know, there, there's so much content that needs to come, not just, it's like, you have to be able to teach your product, but you also need to have to be able to teach like what the product is, the end thing of whatever his product's trying to make, right? So, I mean, I think, um, you know, Webflow University is a great example of, they have a really great course for you to make websites, but I think actually you need to go like a step further with some of these other things like with app builders. Um, and I think, you know, you, I, another a good example of that first one is, you know, MakerPad telling you how to make all these things. But, um, and, and there's tons of these communities, you know, that that are, are starting to, to pop up that I think are amazing. I think we also need to focus on, it's not just like how to use the product, but you know, what ideas should you be solving or, you know, how do you actually launch that product or get feedback on that thing that are actually not like necessarily directly related to like the tool, but like content that I think needs to get created that, that I think is important to focus on. Um, focusing on the, your ability to work with, um, developers in this spectrum i think is really important um but making sure you like don't make it so impossible that or like you know like you it's like oh, one of the philosophies we have is like hiding the advanced stuff um where like you don't see it right away but then you can kind of get to it later and cr crack open some layers and and being able to make sure you do that in a mindful way where like developers can be involved. Um, so you're not stuck on whatever, you know, like extensibility is a, is a big thing with it all to make sure you're not stuck so that it's like, Hey, like, you know, with the component marketplace is obviously one of the bigger things that we were trying to do there of saying, well, if you can, before that you could, maybe you could make 80% of your app, but then that last 20% and you're just like, well, shoot, you're screwed. <laughs> but you know, uh, you know, now with the marketplace or, or the ability for you to make your own private component, like, you know, you could develop, those things are hire just a developer to make that one portion of it. So you're not kind of stuck on it. So I think work, being able to make it work with, with developers, but not have that be like the front, you don't like log into a dollar and then see like a bunch of code that you can write because then all, all of the, you know, no coders would, would be intimidated and, you know, not, not make it down the journey. You know, a lot of no coders are starting to get better and better at actual like tech stuff that like, they can actually like pivot into development and like understand how that works. Right. Um, so um, I think, yeah, that, that's important. Making, maybe making sure that you have the right infrastructure in place. Um, and this is by far the biggest thing that Adal is focusing on right now is, you know, making sure that we're really able to like scale for the future. And it's been, you know, challenging because it's a little like chicken in the egg, short-term, long-term type of like, you know, uh, of, of things that 
I think a lot of startups have to start dealing with, right? But it's like, if you only focus on that at the beginning, then you don't actually get the like people using your product. And then, well, you just built this amazing, you know, road to like a city that doesn't even have a city that no one's there. But then if you don't build all the infrastructure at the right time, then you have this amazing city and, you know, all the, uh, you know, poop is flowing into the streets because you don't have the sewers, right? So um, it's a delicate like balancing act there. Um, and um, so, but really making sure that now Adalo stays focused on those things, I think, um, is super important to us right now. Um, and, uh, you know, something that's at the, like, especially this week has started to really hit home of all the stuff we need to do. So that's definitely top of mind with all the different game plans and stuff that, you know, we have had goals for the, and that we have been working on. And now it's like, okay, we need to work on them even faster and stuff. So um, I think that's an important thing. Um, I think another thing is your, the no-code products that I think are successful or really are going to be successful, especially long-term are the ones where your idea can go from like, it's fine if it's just a little thing and, um, but it also could turn into like a massive thing. And you want, and you, like, you want that whole spectrum is really important. Um, and that's something that's really important to Adalo that we really can have all the spectrums where like, for example, we have like a a dad and a daughter that like made this little like a, a backyard a community, a garden sharing app where like they have all these like neighbors and they have all these like extra, you know, vegetables and stuff that, that uh, you just, well, I have like 40 tomatoes, so I can't, don't know what to do with them. And then they go bad. So like that now, like this community, like trades, like they're like little fruit traders and vegetable traders. And um, you know, it's really cool way for this local community to start. Like, that's just a small thing that could be an amazing app that could like take off. And now it's like across the nation and across the world and everyone's trading it. Right. It's like, I don't know, it's the Airbnb of little backyard community gardens or something, but like, um, you know, that idea like totally works in Adalo and it's totally fine in terms of like, it doesn't cost that much money and you know, they enjoy doing it and it's like a passion thing. And it's just that small little thing. But then there's the other end of the spectrum where it's like, no, like I want this to be, let's say the next Airbnb or whatever it's going to be. And, you know, you're really starting on it and you're really able to start scaling with it. And that means you want not just a, like, that means you also want a full spectrum of, of apps because like the, the users of those apps, some of them want it to be on a desktop and some of them want and like they made the first time browsing and they don't want to download the app yet. So they just want to have it on their web and they go to it and they do whatever it needs to be there. And then you have the fans of that app that are like, no, I really want it in the app store. Cause I want to get push notifications. And like, that's super important to me. You know, like the, the best SaaS products have both web apps and native apps and they work perfectly together. Right. So like that, if like if that little like community garden thing is the small end of the spectrum and then like something like Airbnb is the large end of the spectrum. And let's be honest, I'm sure if you're the size of Airbnb, you're not on a no code platform. Um, but like, um, so I'm not going to claim that that's going to happen, but um, like uh, the, the uh, that idea that like, it can really scale to the, to the point where you are wanting whatever your solution to be to work on all those different platforms and all the different stores versus, you know, on the, on the web and those types of things and having them work together seamlessly is, is like one of our big dreams for Adalo. You know, we definitely don't have amazing, amazing web apps right now. Um, especially you can't make them super responsive right now. Um, and that's something that's really important for us um, after we get this like kind of infrastructure performance stuff, um, you know, turning our attention to making it, um, you really be able to have amazing web apps um, and, and you can design them responsibly and stuff like that is, is definitely like the kind of like next, um, you know, North Star that, that Adal will be going at. It's it's funny that you actually already answered my next question, which, which is <laughs> what's next for Adobe. Yeah. So uh, I guess uh, we should uh, be wrapping it up. Uh, it's been a great conversation, David. 
I would really like to thank you again for taking the time to share with us. Uh, and the, the kind of story that you told us about how the, what, where the name came from is actually one of the things that we were looking for, which yeah. is you know, getting to know uh, a bit more about the companies and about the, the people behind the companies and how things came to be. So thanks, yeah. thanks for sharing. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, you know, if anyone wants to reach out, I will try my best to answer. It's uh, it's 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 hard sometimes, um, but please feel free to reach out. I will. I'll try my best to, you know, chat with you all and help you with any advice and those sorts of things. So thank you very much. It was a great okay. conversation.